uh, Anson Parker. I'm here from uh, Charlottesville. I work at the University of Virginia Health Sciences Library. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about indoor and outdoor accessibility and uh, mapping with our blind, low vision, and mobility challenged community in Charlottesville. Um, first, a little bit of history. Uh, we started working a couple of years ago uh, at Code for Seville, which is a Code for America group. And uh, we're working on housing, uh, housing routers and housing navigators for people. And, you know, we had a bunch of community members and we were like, well, you know, how close are these houses to bus stops? And, you know, we started looking into that because, you know, people were like, well, how do I get from point A to point B? And, you know, the first maps you do, and I know this is redundant here a little bit, but sidewalk mapping is really hard, right? Roads are all connected. That's the way they work. Uh, sidewalks are all not connected. That's that's the deal. So uh, we started looking at that and, you know, and Charlottesville, our map, you know, our hills are like this and our sidewalks are garbage. So we started uh, looking at ways to do our mapping. And, you know, uh, and, and fortunately, we had a, some really good partners. Uh, we worked with visible.org, which is a, a group that does wheelchair accessibility review. That's all they do. And then the National Federation Blind and the Virginia uh, Department of the Blind and Vision Impaired also uh, jumped in to help us and brought in trainers. And, and if you're going to do any of this work, save yourself a ton of time, like work with people who really care about the outcomes. Like otherwise you'll get answers, but they may or may not be that useful. Uh, we, which will bring us to the next slide, which was like, we were really excited because we're a bunch of nerds and we were like, man, we're going to, we're going to LIDAR this stuff and we're going to, we're going to data science this, you know, cause we were, that's what we we're good at. You know, we had all these hammers, you know, and, and the fact is we just ended up burning up undergrads. I mean, we just, yeah, we just shoveled them at the problems. Uh, and that's no, and it worked. I mean, that, is, and that's how things got done. Uh, there, there are, there was no elegance to it, but there was a staggering amount of time and it worked really, really well. Uh, we, we were able to get, uh, and, and it got really, I mean, we got creative stuff out of it too. I mean, some of the undergrads came in and, and uh, Hollis Cutler, she did this uh, QGIS project that ended up like blowing all of our minds. And she, she recreated the maps and made sure everything linked before we even like, before we had the maps worked out, she had come up with some actual pretty elegant solutions, which if anybody wants to talk about, we, we ended up with an API driven product out of that. Um, the other tool that we were really uh, grateful to have access to, and this is out of the Taskar Center, uh, Nick Bolton uh, wrote this. And this kind of gets uh, towards how you do quality control, right? Uh, we use the, the task manager in there. And the task manager, if you haven't used it, uh, typically you break up a, a series of, uh, of maps into grids. But what, what Nick and the Taskar Center did here was a lot better than that, which is that they... Um, they looked at maps and were able to break up the maps based on uh, quadrants related to where the sidewalks actually are, which is really helpful because otherwise, you know, if you're just breaking things down into squares, tracking how things move can get complicated and, and, and it's not intuitive. And by breaking down the map into actual street segments, we were able to get much better quality control. And that was pretty exciting. So uh, here's, this is an old screenshot. But this shows you where we've actually mapped out uh, the data and then where we verified the data, right? And so that, you know, again, that is pretty critical. Uh, you can do it once, but having somebody put a second set of eyes on things really uh, for quality control is pretty important. Um, and so this this was really pretty effective for, for outdoor navigation. Uh, if you're in a wheelchair in Charlottesville, you're you're miserable. It's horrible. Like, but we know why it's bad now. Like we can point to where it's very bad. And that's, that's an improvement. Uh, we can say it's especially bad here, here, and here. Whereas before it was kind of like, well, it's just pretty bad. Um, indoor, uh, mapping is a whole nother animal. Uh, and, and it's awful. Uh, really bad. Uh, you know, most mapping you do with, you know, your location, you gather with satellite data, right? You've got GPS. Indoor, that doesn't work. Um, you don't have satellite access. Uh, and, and the tools for mapping indoors aren't great. Uh, OSM Indoor Edit is pretty good. And I actually just saw that there's some new tools. If you go to OpenStreetMap uh, and Google Indoor Mapping, 
there are a couple of new tools that came out in 2022 that I hadn't seen, and I was pretty excited about that. Um, we actually ended up in the hospital. We worked with, uh, oh, and it, and it really is interesting. This is kind of an important note, but uh, if you're in a wheelchair, you really prefer elevators. If you're blind or low vision, you really prefer stairs. Uh, and, and so for providing routing data, that's really important to be able to suss out those details. Uh, you know, and you can obviously do it manually, but we were we did actually try to approach this initially from a data science perspective, which got us into some really cool tools. The University of Cyprus has a tool called AnyPlace, and this uh, leverages, and we used AnyPlace and TrackR, uh, both are open source. Uh, they use the magnetic sensors in your phone, and actually this is really cool. Uh, they work off of the rebar in buildings, which is kind of neat. And so buildings have a have like a, mag, uh, a thumbprint, a uh, magnetic thumbprint that you can use to get about 15 centimeter accuracy. Uh, and we combine that with the uh, with the altitude data. And, and altimetry is, a, is also typically garbage data. But you if you can get a fixed point that you know on the outside, then you can transpose that afterwards. Like you're always going to get bad height data. Barometric pressure is going to throw it off. But you can track if you know where a fixed point is, you can then branch off of that and, and get about one foot resolution on your data, which was enough to figure out if you're in stairs or if you're in a, you know, so we could actually start finding stairs more automatedly in buildings, which was kind of cool. Just people have these apps on their phone, they can walk around and we can track whether or not they've gone upstairs or whether they've used an elevator reasonably accurately. Um, and that was kind of cool. So we could start actually getting that kind of data. Um, again, we tried to do, uh, so our, our experience with LIDAR indoors, oh, oh, let me start out with what we ended up doing with, for blind and low vision people, we used the touch map, uh, touchmapper.org tool. And, and this was originally designed for 3D printing. Um, you know, I work at the University of Virginia, so we've got, uh, the drama department actually had some really great tools and the architecture school had some great tools and we used lasers uh, and this was super effective. Uh, and I really can't, I meant to bring this map because it was kind of fun to make, but in about 15 minutes, we can make maps. And, and this was for uh, a trade fair. And it, this is one of the things that kind of, I think is exciting about Open street map and mapping data in general is that we could take a base map that was produced by TouchMapper and then augmented pretty quickly to have like, this is where the, the trade fair desks were. Um, and the idea is that really you should be able to whip out a tactile map quickly and affordably, right? Um, most blind low vision people don't need a tactile map for like just day-to-day -day use. It's for when like a job fair or like a trade show. And it's like, okay, it's a place that I know, but there's new stuff in the environment. How do I get around here? How do I use that? How do I find that information? And so really this was, you know, a $2 product over at the drama department. They had this uh, kind of this vacuum press and for about 50 cents, we can duplicate these. So you can like, there's just almost no excuse for not being able to produce this kind of content. Uh, and I think that's pretty exciting. Um, again, LIDAR, total failure. Uh, LIDAR can give you reasonably decent accuracy, but the user interface is just not there. It's not up to, to anything that's usable. We worked with a bunch of blind programmers, actually, which was super fun. Um, if you want to know if your uh, app works, get a blind person to use it. You'll, you'll find out how your user interface is um, they, that it's it's a very cool experience, but um, it, it it just frankly lidar just didn't do anything for us in that case. Um, lidar with wheelchair accessibility was a little bit more nuanced. I, it was okay. Like we were, you know, we were doing uh, accessibility reviews of rooms, and so a room like this would probably be okay because the stairs. You know, the, the accuracy you're going to get is about three centimeters, and that's not good enough for wheelchair, but like those stairs there are probably like, you know, 15 centimeters, 10 centimeters, something like that. 
So it's probably enough. Uh, it, it would probably catch that, but it, it really isn't good enough for a lot of other stuff. You know, we used a couple of apps uh, that were pretty, uh, Polyscan was pretty good for measuring and, and it was better. Like you could go in and, and maybe you didn't remember to measure something. And so you've got a LIDAR scan of the room and you go back and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot to measure that thing. Like now I can look at it and, and look at it a little bit more accurately. It, it was it was good, but it wasn't great. And it wasn't, it was far from acceptable outside. I mean, but indoors it, it was, I don't think they're using it. I mean, again, we were partnered with visible, uh, visitable.org on this and I don't think they're using it. I think they have gone back to measuring tapes and photographs for most stuff. I, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about trying to crowdsource it, but it just, you know, again, you can go back, you can measure stuff. It's kind of cool, but it's just, you really need higher accuracy, you know, I, and, you know, I think anything over a half inch is going to be kind of a barrier if, you know, if you're in a wheelchair um, and, and these, the, the iPad Pro, which is what we were using and other, you know, commercial LiDAR, just not going to give you the, the, the resolution that you need. Um, so yeah, the, the LiDAR, uh, just not that great. I mean, there's a ton of learning curves. The workflows weren't great. Um, I'm sure it's improving, but I haven't seen anything that seemed uh, really worth the effort. Um, thanks. Yeah. Oh, and if anybody wants to talk about this one, I'm just putting it out there. I've been working on this foam.space grant. It was awful. But if anybody has any thoughts on it, it's a proof of location uh, product that I, it's interesting, but I haven't found a single. Well, no, we have a use case for it. Uh, it's for voting, but I haven't found any use case for it that that really worked. Anyhow, I want to thank uh, Lyricist for some of the grants, uh, the Center for Civic Innovation for supporting some of this work. Uh, Lena Wen, who was a UVA student who just rocked out. Uh, Maitri Patel, who did the indoor hospital mapping. Uh, Maggie Colley and Justin Buehler were awesome. And if anybody has any questions or any thoughts, feel free to reach out. Thank you.